Welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith. I'm Larry Gent, and this is the message for Grace Hartwood United Methodist Church on Sunday, August 16th. Well, this is our 11th and final message in a sermon series on the book of Revelation. I hope you've enjoyed this study. If you've been with us for all 11 messages, you are now an expert on the book of Revelation, and you can tell everyone, God's going to win. Someday a bright new wave will break upon the shore, and there will be no sickness, no more crying. Last week we covered the, the eternal doom of the evil ones. This week we cover the eternal bliss of the blessed ones. Look at 21 verse 1. You know all things in this world decay and die, but we know decay and death are not part of God's plan. So God must create a new heaven and a new earth where those things are not present. I know you, you beach lovers may not like the idea of heaven without an ocean, but by now you know why John distrusted the sea. There will be no place for evil invaders to storm these eternal shores. In verse 2, you might recall that way back in Revelation 12, we met a mysterious celestial woman with a goddess-like appearance. She was giving birth to the Messiah, but she was clearly bigger than the earthly girl Mary. The great dragon was trying to destroy her, and I made the case that this woman was the church giving birth to the Christ. Here we see that the church is identified as the bride of God. Together, God and the church create all things good. In fact, I would claim that God has invested so much creative power in the church that even God Almighty cannot create some things without her cooperation. So you see, the church is not simply God's servant. The church becomes God's partner in this new creation. Looking at verse 3, last winter as we entered Advent, you might recall that I preached a sermon about Job's challenge to God. In his pain, Job cried out, What right does God have to judge me? He sits safe in his heaven, where there's no sorrow, no suffering, no bleeding, no dying, no tears. Let God come down here, and we'll talk. I believe that challenge echoed and rang throughout the heavenly halls until it was answered in a manger in Bethlehem of Judea. God came down to walk among us. But in the new heaven and the new earth, all separation between us and God will be erased. Emmanuel, God dwells with us. In verse 4, we see that he will wipe away the very last tear from our eyes. I've been reading this verse at every graveside service I perform for more than 40 years now, and it still moves me to tears every time. 
I believe this is the key verse for our Bible study this week, and we'll return to it as we close this study. Skipping ahead to verse 10, you can see that John's preference shows loud and clear. You may have heard us hill folk say, God visits the beach, but God lives in the mountains. Well, for the Jewish mind, it was impossible to imagine heaven without Jerusalem on Mount Zion. But there's something more here. This is not a heavenly do-over on what went wrong on earth below. This is the heavenly reality of the shadows of earth. Our music and worship in church foreshadow heaven's reality of worship. Mount Zion was a foretaste of heaven's mighty summit. Jerusalem was a fallen, frail piece of heavenly truth. Our lives on earth catch fleeting glimpses of God's revelation, but in eternity we finally see what is completely real. Looking ahead at verse 22, as was the case from the very first verses of this book, John sees heaven as flashes of light, wrapped in light, glinting with light, and bathed with light. An exile to Patmos might be forgiven for wanting to get away from the ocean, but John sees that midday sun and all its brilliance as part of God's eternal plan. There is no need for a temple here. The temple foreshadowed the way for people to approach God on earth. But in heaven, there's no need to approach our Savior. We are united with God forever and ever. Turning ahead to chapter 22, we see that a river runs through the middle of that heavenly city. I'm pretty sure that river is stocked with trout because God could have made heaven better by doing that. And I know God thought of that before I did. In the Holy Land, running water is a rare gift. It's hard to find. They had a name for running water. They called it living water. That was an eternal promise that Jesus made to the woman at the well, and we see that promise flowing to all of us here. If you knew who was speaking to you, he said, you would ask me for living water, and you would never thirst again. Here it is in John's vision of heavenly reality an eternally flowing stream of living water. Looking at verse 2, when they were expelled from Eden, Adam and Eve lost the way to the tree of life. Now it blooms year-round and offers healing to all the nations. This vision is only for those who know God, but it does not shut anyone out. The whole world is invited to come and be healed. The curse came to earth when people fell from grace. Now grace has been restored and the curse has been erased. In verse 6, we see a promise. This is one of the reasons we read Revelation. The words are true, and we're promised a blessing for reading this book and keeping it in our hearts. I trust that this study has been a blessing to you. I know that at times John's method is a little bewildering, but we know the core of his message. We know the big picture, and we know that it's true. 
It's good to keep that big picture in your heart. Look at verse 17. This is how we know that the message of Revelation is a promise, not a threat. The Spirit and the Bride of Christ agree. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. When I was first introduced to Revelation as a teenager, it was hard for me to understand this. The coming of Christ felt like a threat. But now as I dwell in the autumn of life and feel the coming chill of winter, I understand. This world is not my home. This world will tremble and quake. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be pandemics and problems. The poor will suffer and the good will die young. But when Jesus comes, it will all be made right. Our hearts yearn for that day as a caged dove yearns for the sky. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We need you now as never before. The book concludes by repeating the promise and the response. Amen. It means Yes, I agree. Let it be so. The Lord is coming quickly for those who need him most, and our hearts still cry out. I agree. Let it be so. And so, friends, we've reached the end of this amazing book. But before we close, Let's return to verse 4 and this awesome promise. Once again, John quotes the prophet Isaiah. He will wipe away the very last tear from our eyes. The nail-scarred hand of Christ will touch our scars and say, It's all right now. It's all right. It's finally all right. It's really all right. When we say amen in the Cherokee language, we say osta, osta da, osta da. It means that's all right. That's all right. That's really all right. As a pastor, there have been so many times I've wanted to comfort those who wept. I wanted to smooth away their tears and say, it's all right now. It's all right. As a father and grandfather, I've been moved with compassion so many times. I want to kiss, kiss away the tears of my sweet children and whisper, it's all right now. It's all right. But we know the truth is that in this life, it's never going to be completely all right. Not really. There will always be another cycle of grief. There will always be another scar, another heartache. There will always be another tear ready to fall. But there is a new day coming. And I can say it's going to be all right. The prophet Isaiah says your name has been engraved on the palm of his hand. So when he reaches out to catch your final tear, take a good close look at his hand. The world sees nothing but the scars of a nail but you're going to see that scar has actually been your name all along. And he's been planning this moment since before you were born. 
He's finally going to smooth away your tears and heal your scars, and he'll finally whisper to you, Osta, Osta da. It's all right. It's finally all right. And in that moment, you'll know God has won. Someday a bright new wave will break upon the shore. And there will be no sickness, no more crying, no more. new